To those of you who were here for the Trials Network yesterday, this is the completion of the story. And for those of you who weren't here yesterday, this is a culmination of 25 years uh, worth of work. I always like to show my hero, that is the lungless salamander, because he shows us that nature has been addressing the, the concept of alternative gas exchange techniques for the last several million years. And this critter shows us that you don't need lungs to transfer gas. Uh, but growing on that theme of comparative physiology, we had the idea uh, a little over almost 10, uh, 15 years ago, that uncoupling carbon dioxide and, and oxygen transfer as physiologic events in the lung was the key to being able, uh, able to address the pathophysiology of lung failure. And if you, if you recognize that it's just packaging that we breathe in and out, but it's the in that allows oxygenation, it's the out that allows excretion of the byproducts of metabolism. So we developed the idea from an old Scribner shunt that most of you in this room had experience with of doing arterial venous access through a low resistance gas exchanger in order to accomplish CO2 removal. This uncoupled CO2 removal and oxygenation it allowed CO2 to be transferred across the membrane gas exchanger and allowed us to use extremely low respiratory rates to transfer oxygen, generally two to four breaths per minute. And this was first uh, conceived by Ted Colabo as much as 40 years ago, uh, but he didn't have the technology of the application. Uh, this shows a series of sheep experiments that we did uh, back in the 90s, the late 90s, to show that a, a shunt to 30% was well tolerated. You could use percutaneous cannulas to access the artery in the vein, especially in the groin. We could get significant reductions in ventilator pressures and improve gas exchange. And in fact, we could improve survival in an LD50 uh, sheep model of respiratory failure. We then took this to the IRB which allow, and the FDA, which allowed us to do five pilot patients in two institutions. And uh, these patients were those that had failed all of their therapies or didn't uh, meet the indications for any other alternative therapy. We did percutaneous access, as you can see. We then put on the simple arteriovenous loop, and these patients were then followed. And the first five patients, three of the five were discharged. Of course, nobody believed us. And then we had to repeat the study. We did eight more patients, of which five of which were discharged. Again, nobody believed us except a group in Regensburg, Germany, when I went to Europe and gave these series of talks. They thought, actually, that there was some merit to this work and pursued it. Uh, in fact, they got in touch with a, a company over in Germany, which had off-the-shelf components that they packaged into a uh, device called the Novolung, or the ILA, which basically is, just took the Quadrox gas exchanger off the shelf and coupled it uh, with their different cannulas. Uh, that's been marketed now for several years, and there's now been over 3,000 applications of this technology uh, in Europe. There's also been an application in transport of patients. Those of you who know somebody in severe respiratory failure, uh, if they can't tolerate a ventilator or a ventilator is inadequate, uh, putting them on ECMO or a, a heart-lung bypass is awkward. Uh, for a helicopter or even a fixed wing device. So in Germany, uh, they've developed this extracorporeal CO2 removal device, and almost every patient can tolerate having their CO2 removed and holding breaths to achieve oxygenation for at least a brief period of time. We were trying to explain why this seemed to work. I mean, really, we've all struggled for the last decades on how to transfer gas in a, in a dying patient, and we couldn't quite figure out why just removing the CO2 was so effective. So it took us several years to develop a sheet model of, of severe respiratory failure where we could predictably get an LD100 in a sheep that had, been, uh, had an induced injury. So we then uh, did a smoke burn injury, which is a combined two-hip model, put them on a, a volume control mechanical ventilation for 24 to 48 hours, at which time they had to meet ARDS criteria. Funny thing, about 20% don't meet the criteria, and it's, it's very interesting to think why they don't. But nevertheless, 80% do, and once they uh, meet the criteria for ARDS, we then randomize them to AVCO2 removal, the current Vogue, which is low tidal volume, and one other alternative, which is high-frequency percussive ventilation. What we found was that the AVCOR did, in fact, improve survival in this group as well. We did some pathophysiology studies, and there's a lot of data to show that it pacifies the neutrophils and allows them to undergo apoptosis as opposed to necrosis, and that's a whole other line of study. Uh, to summarize, uh, there's the, um, a number of groups have pursued, pursued this. The ones in Regensburg continue to be very active. They've done a retrospective analysis in trauma patients, 
in which they feel they had improved survival. They've also, the group in Toronto has applied this technology as either a bridge to transplant or as a bridge to recovery, and they continue to be active uh, contributors to this literature. And uh, the company, Novolong, has sponsored a number of clinical trials, which we talked about yesterday, and there's many in, in this room that are willing to participate in these studies as they matriculate to the United States. Uh, they're mostly a uh, prospective randomized study comparing AVCO2 removal to kind gentle ventilation, which is a current technique. There's also the Toronto Lung Transplantation Trial where it's being used as a bridge to transplant, and also the concept of being used to treat exacerbations during COPD. Uh, the Nova Lung Registry is, continues to be active. Uh, there's uh, several of us that are on an advisory panel that try to keep them honest. Obviously, it's a company. Obviously, they have a conflict of interest, and we try to make sure that they only process raw data uh, and try to only s to select patients that come as they present. There's a routine normalization of CO2 and pH, and it allows a dramatic reduction in mechanical ventilation or uh, minute ventilation. And it appears, if it's applied within two days of onset of ARDS, that there's a fairly dramatic change in the pathophysiology and the management of these patients. But that's the preamble of what I'm here to talk about. And that is, uh, for the last 25 years, I've been working on the development of the artificial lung, which is the holy grail of this whole effort to try to serve as either a bridge to transplant, which you heard earlier, that's one of the keys to being able to manage a lung transplant program is being able to either procure donors or keep your recipient pool alive long enough in order to have that match up. So we, uh, being cardiac surgeons by nature, cardiothoracic surgeons by nature, uh, we, are, we used our uh, experience with cardiopulmonary bypass to start off this whole effort, and in fact, as, as recently as three years ago, we were still pursuing the idea of a right ventricular assist device providing cardiac output support uh, through a gas exchanger in order to help uh, relieve right heart failure. It required only one pulmonary artery anastomosis. You could put it in without cardiopulmonary bypass, and it spared the pulmonary hilum for subsequent transplant. And we uh, put this in our large animal model, our sheep model, to see if we could get uh, what we perceive as a meaningful period of time of support, which we target as one month. Uh, back in early 2006, we were able to come up with a, con con a uh, setup that allowed a two-week period where a sheep could stand with no sedation, stand in the cage, look at you, and have total support. We then refined that over that year, came up with a little bit better devices as we took uh, off-the-shelf components and applied it to this application, and we were able to go to four weeks and at that point, we were starting to feel like we had something uh, perhaps worth talking about because we could now go a month or would allow a transplant program, a bridge to uh, transplant. However, the biggest problem is the sheep itself and trying to achieve ambulation. As you know, a transplant candidate is far better if they can walk around. And uh, if the sheep here, he'd get up, eat his hay and bang it on the side of the cage and rip off that pulmonary anastomosis. Now, I can't tell you how much fun that is to get the call about the sheep ripping off the PA anastomosis. And we kept thinking, you know, that would be really an unhappy experience on a human. So we kept thinking that uh, those of you in the room here that have been following this literature, I can see you going, pulmonary artery anastomosis? So we always thought that maybe we should try to come up with an alternative technique uh, based on the double lumen catheter to avoid a thoracotomy, avoid major artery cannulation. And this all played on something that I had worked on back in 1984. An engineer and I got together and went to a machine shop and took uh, a metal lathe and uh, stainless steel tubing and designed a double lumen catheter, which was picked up by the Kendall company and became the Kendall double lumen catheter. There was a standard of care for ECMO for about 20 years. The problem with this cannula is that we, the way we designed it, it had a 20% recirculation rate. So that meant that just when the patient was getting sicker and just when you needed more gas exchange, you'd crank up the flow and look, you'd get more recirculation and defeat the whole purpose. So it was very frustrating to have this catheter if a patient went sour. Now if they did well, it was fine, which is why the catheter lasted for 20 years. So we started thinking of alternatives of how we could get venous access in order to achieve